Good morning. I'm pleased to announce this morning's keynote. Lawrence Hicks, Vice President of Engineering at Intertalk Critical Information Systems. Larry has worked for Motorola, Philips, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. He co-founded Intertalk, then called Pantel, in 1997. He holds two E911 patents and has a Bachelor of Science in Physics. He began his interest in amateur radio at the age of nine, getting his signal call sign as early as the government would allow at age 15. Please welcome Inner Talks, Larry Hicks. Thank you. In the summer of 1978, two companions and I sailed across the Atlantic Ocean from Newfoundland, where I come from, uh, to Ireland. It wasn't a very big boat, 31 foot long, and it took us 21 days to get there. While we were at sea, we had a storm. Nothing focuses the mind like a storm at sea. In 1997, I co-founded a company called, now called Intertalk, and this is how we see that the, in the industry currently. We believe that dispatch is more than just taking calls and coordinating first responders. There's a lot of information processing and information handling that has to happen in order for the right information to get to the right place at the right time and in the right format. Traditional dispatch, as it's called, is somewhat reactive. We respond to things, to phone calls that are coming in or to the situations that are developing on the ground. And that reactiveness um, or response that we have in traditional dispatch is a, uh, a key part of the dispatch function. One of the things that's happening in uh, the modern world is as information becomes more and more prevalent and there are different uh, ways of us receiving information and there are certainly many more um, information sources that are available, sometimes we can find that dispatchers can become distracted. We are in a, a time of change and that change is bleeding over into our traditional uh, dispatch functionality. Because of that available information I'm talking about and because there's so much of it and it comes at us at such a great rate, Sometimes we can even go backwards. For example, in some places, since 2003, the actual emergency response times for emergency services have actually increased, in some places, by as much as 10% or more. <clears throat> we analyzed why this might be, and we found that because there are so many different information sources now, the information that's available to dispatchers and to first responders isn't necessarily helpful, and in some cases, as I mentioned, the uh, dispatch, dispatchers can become distracted by extraneous information. Of course, there's also many different ways of sending emergency calls for help now, and uh, some of these method and methods are not as uh, direct as the old landline systems were. So consequently, it's uh, ended up the emergency response time. <clears throat> Remember that 911 is a motto of when seconds count. When we see our emergency response times creeping up, of course, that's a, a source of great consternation, and we have to look at ways to uh, reduce our response times. Currently, we face, not only in the dispatcher community, but also just in general, in our day-to-day -day activity, we face a fire, hose of a fire hose of information. And that information comes to us from all these different sources. I don't know about you guys, but I find myself looking up something and I go to a internet site and I read about it and it's very interesting. But then there's something down here in the lower corner, a little bit of clickbait as they call it. And I go to that site and I read something else equally as interesting and then another piece of clickbait. And after an hour or two, I find myself wondering what I was looking for originally. And of course, one of the key parts of this information overload that we have is a, is a question, is that information reliable 
We live in an age of fake news. We live in an age where the information that comes to us may come secondhand or thirdhand. So we have to uh, always wonder about the reliability, the veracity of what we hear. And of course, another aspect of it is how valuable is that information? Something that happened before is not really as valuable as the things that are happening now. I like to say that someone is shooting at me now is much more critical than somebody shot at me yesterday. So with all this information that, we're, that we have in our lives, we, um, we have to have a way of handling the information. And one of the ways that our company is approaching it is we're looking at uh, a process called curation. We're going to curate the information. <clears throat> when we are, are thinking about the equipment that's used by dispatchers, the equipment is meant to support the dispatcher's functions. And one of the aspects of, uh, of supporting um, in the next generation is we have to support the dispatchers with their information processing capability. And that's what curation is about. We're going to provide tools to the dispatcher which allows the information that's coming to them to be um, curated. So we know that it's reliable. We have the right information and that's at the right time and that we put it in the right format that's most useful for the first responders. However, searching for that information takes time. We have the time required to go through some sort of search engine. We also have the time required for the internet or the intranet to be able to fetch the information back to us. One of the things, for instance, that curation is involved in, or some, one of the things that curation involves is caching information. So if we use natural language processing as an example and artificial intelligence, we can pre-cache information that's going to be likely necessary in the call. For instance, uh, we can pre-cache traffic patterns. If we know that there's, a, um, if there's going to be a, a dispatch to a certain specific address uh, and we know where the apparatus is, we can look at the traffic volumes and the traffic uh, tie-ups along the way and that information is immediately available to the dispatcher. One of the key aspects as well is having a dynamic display. You want to make sure that the display that's in front of the dispatcher actually has the information and has all of the tools necessary for the dispatcher to do the best job possible. Having a dynamic display, which just means it updates in real time, and we have information that's not only uh, critical to what we're doing, but also information that's of interest to what we're doing is displayed on the screen at the same time. However, we have to remember that the dispatcher's primary uh, aim is mission focus. We must always remember to support the mission of whatever is happening currently, and that focus is critical. However, we still need to have a window to the world, if you like, a way to uh, maintain uh, contact and connection to items that might be of interest or that might come to the fore during the mission. So we need to have that window to the world. And the window to the world nowadays comes about because we have the internet. And the internet, as I said before, a great source of information so I'm possibly also a great source of misinformation. And again, the curating process that our equipment brings allows us to be able to differentiate one from the other. Focus is very important. As a matter of fact, a, a famous Canadian named Alexander Graham Bell, well, some people argue he's a Scot. Some people say he was an American. But Alexander Graham Bell said, concentrate all your thoughts upon the work at hand. The sun's rays do not burn until brought to a focus. So the focus that we're talking about for public safety dispatch is to focus on the mission at hand without losing sight of the other things that are important to the job. So if we need to provide different information resource tools. I spoke before about natural language uh, processing, the ability to be able to parse text, for example, and even voice communications. Um, we have methods, for instance, where we can um, analyze someone who's speaking and tell whether how much stress they're under. Um, these type of tools provide um, more ways for the dispatcher to utilize the information that's at hand. The information that uh, um, is provided to the dispatcher might come in the form, for instance, of geographical information, which is very important. One of the key things about the GIS or about uh, AVL and those type of things is to make sure that the mapping that we provide to the dispatcher is actually a dynamic. So the mapping actually reflects the reality of what's happening on the ground. 
if we have sensors, and of course, a lot of people have been talking about the IoT in universe, and IoT is uh, all about sensing and about sensors. So as those sensors become available to the dispatch center, we want to be able to bring back that information in a real-time format and then display it dynamically on a map. We might, for instance, be able to um, be able to display uh, a building layout, but not just a building layout as a ground floor, but be able to show it as a three-dimensional object. And that three-dimensional object then provides more information about where fire hoses in the building might be located if it was a fire situation. One of the, also, one of the other key aspects of all of this is to make sure that we record everything. One of the uh, things that we're working on, um, besides artificial intelligence in the dispatch center, is the concept of using machine learning. <clears throat> so for many, uh, uh, many years, we, we, uh, recording uh, um, system has been used in the dispatch center so that we can record the voice of what's going on. And then afterwards, we can uh, look at it for legal purposes, but we can also use it for training the dispatchers. The same idea can be used in the uh, system, the information handling systems. If we use a machine learning algorithm, which actually takes um, what happened in the past because we've recorded everything and then looks at the outcome and makes adjustments uh, so that the next time that, that a similar sort of event occurs, we can handle it with the more up-to-date information. And of course, one of the other aspects in the modern world is that dispatch is becoming less and less about a place and more and more about a service. If you think about it, there's no real reason in today's age where we have tremendous mobility and where we have IP basically everywhere, there's no real reason for a dispatch center to be uh, a location. We're not tied to equipment anymore. We can be uh, free from it uh, so that we can have operational mobility. And that operational mobility and the fact that we've freed ourselves from the equipment in the back office or in the back room uh, means that we can also uh, have geo redundancy. So if there is a problem that occurs in an area, there's a fire, a flood, or maybe even an anthrax threat, we can abandon the center that we're in and we can move to a different, safer place. However, it's not a backup center. It's actually a continuation of the operation that we had when we were in the original center. So this is operational mobility, not just a backup or disaster recovery type of, uh, of an effect. Now, it's very important for us to recognize that the dispatch function is not going away. People sometimes talk about how artificial intelligence will take over the dispatch function and eliminate the need for human beings. I predict that that's not going to happen. I think that the human element in dispatch will always be there and will always be a key and critical element of that function. However, one of the things that the newer technologies give to us is the ability to be able to migrate to migrate, as I was talking about before, from a location or from an equipment-centric focus to a service-centered focus. One of the things that we can do is we can take dispatch and we can put it in the cloud. We can actually have dispatch as a service. One of the things that we have to be concerned about when we do that, and of course we're concerned about it in general, not just from the point of view of the moving forward of dispatch as a service, is security. In the dispatch uh, arena, we can't think of security as being a negotiable thing or something that is uh, to be an afterthought. Security has to be built into the process. And especially if we move forward as a service, we make a dispatch system that works in the cloud, one of the key aspects that we have to address right at the beginning is how we're going to manage security. And that's a, a key element of it. However, we, we believe we've overcome that and we believe that we've got a solution for it. So now we can talk about dispatch not as a place, not even as a group of people anymore, but dispatch as a service. And taking that as the next step in the logical evolution of the dispatch function, which we've had for many, many years, allows us to be able to think about things in a much different way, much more exciting way. I have a hero, his name is Dwight D. Eisenhower, who once said, in preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. The very nature of the dispatch function that we uh, are part of um, means that we, we always are surprised. Emergencies do not come with announcements most often. Emergencies don't come with a built-in immediate plan. 
every one of the emergencies that we face in our day-to-day -day lives has some particular difference or some particular thing. And emergency response is by its very nature chaotic. However, the one thing which Dwight D. Eisenhower points out in this quote is that although the plans that we make might turn out to not be as useful as we had hoped, the planning for it is indispensable. So we need to plan out how the dispatch function is going to work and when it's going to work and where it's going to work. And again, back to what I said before, we need to provide the right information at the right time in the right format. Back in that day when I was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and we faced that storm, I recognized something about myself. First of all, I recognized that I was up to it, which was a significant thing because I didn't know beforehand whether or not I was going to be able to face something like that. And the second thing I learned was that when the storm hits, it's too late to prepare. When you're in the midst of the storm, you have to manage as best you can. So what I would like to leave you with is essentially the need to look at the evolution which is happening in dispatch and which will happen in the next few years and help us and all manufacturers to plan how we're going to address that with, uh, with the upcoming changes that the dispatchers and the dispatch managers and the first responders know is coming. My name is Larry Hicks, and um, our booth is number 1561. If you'd like to discuss any of the things I talked about here, um, we'd welcome, welcome you to our booth to have a little talk about it. And I thank you very much for your attention.